On April 5th, uh, we got out of bed about 4.30 in the morning, ate breakfast, checked the weather, got suited up, and uh, jumped in the Astro van to ride to the launch pad. I frankly didn't have a lot of confidence we were going to launch that morning. It was raining at the time, but uh, the weather cleared, and off we went. After what was a textbook countdown and a very short hold, the uh, liftoff was, I might say, very entirely nominal and entirely exciting. The uh, <laughs> engines uh, started at T-minus six seconds, followed by SRB ignition and roll program to a direction of due east off the pad. The vehicle, its four and a half million pound stack with orbiter tank and SRBs, continued to accelerate upward and uh, going faster and faster through ever uh, uh, decreasing density air, we approached the point of uh, maximum dynamic pressure, about Mach 1, and here you can see uh, shock waves standing off the uh, uh, frustrums of the solid rocket boosters. The uh, first stage continued for approximately two minutes at which time the solid rocket boosters had expended all their fuel and uh, they were uh, jettisoned into the ocean. Here you see the boosters being separated and as they continue to burn out they would uh, parachute back into uh, the Atlantic Ocean for recovery and analysis. Main engine uh, burn continued for a total of eight and a half minutes at which time we achieved our MECO velocity on target and uh, set ourselves up for our OMS-2 burn and arrival on orbit. One of the most significant events that we perform early uh, after getting into orbit is the opening of the payload bay doors, which you're seeing here. Not only is this significant for us to set up shop and to be able to stay on orbit, but it also provides us with our first uh, very beautiful view of the Gamma Ray Observatory back there in the back end of the bus, and, and that's the prime reason we were there, and we were all ready to go to work. The opening of the doors also gives you an opportunity to use those uh, aft windows to take a look at some of the Earth's beautiful views and. This was an early one as we came across uh, northeastern Africa. On flight day two, we set up some preparations for deploying the Gamma Ray Observatory. Those were three main types. One was getting uh, the Gamma Ray Observatory all checked out in cooperation with the Payload Operations Control Center and Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt. Uh, the second was to prepare ourselves by pre-breathing pure oxygen so that when Jerry and I went down to five PSI in the suits, we wouldn't get the bends. The third was preparing the suits for the EVA, and Jerry's starting that uh, here. We checked out all the suits in case there was a contingency EVA. Uh, on the third flight day here, Linda had grappled uh, the grow with the arm, and here we are preparing to release the latches which hold the Gamma Ray Observatory into the cargo bay. And we are releasing the uh, fourth and fifth of those uh, latches. Uh, after uh, we checked out the pocket, checked out the systems as much as possible, uh, and Jade released those latches, the, uh, I used the arm to start lifting grow out of the bay. Now, this is a 35,000-pound payload, the heaviest we've ever uh, moved about on orbit with the arm. And while it doesn't uh, weigh anything, it has all those properties of mass, so you have to move it very, very slowly. Except time seems speeded up a bit when you're actually doing this in the aft flight deck of the orbiter. Uh, so you can see there, all the appendages are still stowed. The arrays are folded up uh, like accordions on the left and right side, and you can see uh, the end of the uh, high-gain antenna dish underneath there still folded up. We moved it straight up out of the bay uh, to what we called a low hover position, and then put the arm into an uh, automatic mode that basically just uh, moved it a bit in translation, but mostly pitched it over about 110 degrees. And, uh, once we got the arm up to that position, uh, that was where it was to have stayed until a release. Here you see it after the first solar array has uh, been deployed, and that went just like clockwork. Uh, matter of fact, the whole arm ops worked very smooth, and uh, we were on the timeline here. The other, uh, the other solar array you see actually in the process of being deployed. And uh, the, next, uh, the next step in the deploy process after we maneuvered to an attitude, Steve did that to start charging these, was to, uh, to deploy the high-gain antenna boom. Once we realized that the nominal and several uh, other attempts would not release the high-gain antenna boom, it was time to uh, begin preparations for the EVA means of unlatching and deploying the boom. Here you can see Steve assisting Jay with his lower torso assembly while I was in the airlock uh, helping to prepare Jerry, who was already uh, inside of the hard upper torso of the suit. The uh, EVA was one that we had trained for and uh, prepared very thoroughly for. GROW was designed for a lot of EVA work to be uh, done on it, and we performed a uh, unscheduled or quick response EVA to uh, take care of a problem that uh, someone fortunately had uh, foreseen. Here you can see the two crew members exiting the airlock to begin their work. Well, as Ken said, we had thoroughly trained to uh, be prepared to react to spacecraft contingencies such as this, and uh, we were uh, 
out on the spacecraft uh, very quickly, uh, surveyed the situation, did not see anything that should have been causing the boom to hang up, and with some uh, relatively uh, easy force inputs, were able to jostle the boom free. Uh, analysis uh, now says that probably there was just a uh, little bit of thermal cover on the boom that was hanging up on some of the spacecraft structure. Uh, I think at this point I, uh, I yelled gleefully, it's free, it's free. Uh, as far as I was concerned, when that boom came free, that made uh, my flight for me. It, it was uh, the only reason that, uh, that we went on on this spacewalk and uh, with the successful freeing of this boom, uh, we then uh, translated over to the other side of the spacecraft where uh, Jay and I uh, completed the task of uh, putting the boom into its on-orbit position. You can see this other view now. Uh, I'm in a foot restraint and uh, Jay is supporting me and watching uh, my legs to make sure that we don't do any damage to the spacecraft as I very slowly and gingerly uh, raise the boom up to its full deployed position and then with a wrench was able to drive a uh, mechanical system over center which locked that boom into its on-orbit position. Then Jay and I uh, quickly uh, left the spacecraft so that the uh, POC could turn on the spacecraft's transmitters and receivers and fully check out the spacecraft in preparation for release. And during that time, uh, both JSEC here and, and me in the other window uh, had a chance to come up and uh, say hi to the folks inside and see what they were doing. I think they were eating at this time, Jay, if I remember no, we, right, we while busy. we were outside we were working. Busy. Busy. <laughs> <laughs> we're saying hi through the window to them there. Well, at some point after that, uh, as a matter of fact, it was a good bit of time later, the arrays, we moved it back up to the release position. The arrays were fully charged. Uh, the POC finished testing out all the systems. It looked really great. We were ready to release GROW, which we do by opening the snares on the arm and very carefully backing away so as not to uh, provide any rates on it, although a 35,000 payload is pretty stable up there in space. That's what we found out. Uh, we waited, and as soon as uh, the arm was clear, uh, Ken called that to Steve. When the arm was clear. Uh of course, it was called to me. We just to reset the digital autopilot and uh, put some pulses in to move slowly away from the grow. It it appeared to be as slow as you see in this film, <coughs> so slowly that I checked our displays to make sure it was the right rate. But it was about a half a foot a second, which is just a slow drift away. There's a little thing you see fly by in this picture, which caught my attention at first too. It was a piece of debris in the lens of the camera itself, which. Now, the first time I saw it, I thought there was a piece of something coming off the, the orbiter of the spacecraft, but it wasn't, of course. We slowly drifted away and uh, watched it go away from us and then set up for two more separation burns, uh, the second of which was about 22 or so minutes after this first one, and it was out of plane a couple of feet a second just to get out of the, the orbital plane of GROW. Here you see it going away. And the third was called a posigrade separation burn, which got us above and behind the orbit of GROW. Uh, and then later we came back to within eight miles of it for a separate test. Here's a, just a shot around the cabin. Uh, you'll see a lot of cameras over there on the left side, and we took a lot of pictures of the ground on this flight with uh, Hasselblad 70 millimeters, and also the big one you see is uh, the Errol Linhoff, which we fly quite a bit. Uh, the, the flight deck uh, was relatively uncluttered. As we pan around to the right-hand side, you'll see our ham shack. And, uh, we're all licensed amateur radio operators, although I have to say uh, Ken is hands down the most experienced, so he was the senior ham on the flight. And uh, he did quite a bit of operations with the equipment. You can see just a few cables over there on his side, which he kept uh, quite well under control, I might add. And uh, back on the other panel are our, our recording devices, two orbiter VTRs and a, a separate one that we flew. We had a list of uh, secondary experiments and tasks. It's too long to elaborate on uh, here for you, but uh, this is just an e example of one of them, a little air sampler that we would change positions on each day. I chose all the hard experiments to do like this for myself. <clears throat> all I had to do was reset it and uh, log, log a time that I did it. Uh, Jerry and I worked on another, uh, one of the MIGDEC experiments that we had. Its, uh, it's uh, acronym was SHARE. It was a very small abbreviated version of a heat pipe that uh, they hope to be able to design someday for large space structures. And the idea is uh, you move fluids around by methods that are supposed to work in zero G, such as wetting and capillary action. But the problem we keep seeing up there is uh, we get a lot of bubbles in these things and they don't settle out without gravity uh, to make them rise to the surface. And so we just did some more work on them on transferring fluids around and a couple of test articles that we had and were able to send down uh, uh, some direct camcorder video to the ground to show what we were doing. 
at the end of a successful deployment of our primary payload and an EVA, as you might imagine, our spirits were very high, so much so that we decided to celebrate that evening by having dinner on the ceiling. And uh, dining in the mid-deck is uh, quite an experience. We're all in different orientations. And uh, as you can see, that uh, we were quite informal. And in fact, table manners were uh, somewhat optional. Uh, dinner was uh, very good. Uh, food on board the sh space shuttle is excellent. Uh, we had a good galley, and uh, we all sort of pitched in. Whoever was free uh, took over the, uh, the duties of pr preparation. Uh, when we got uh, to the end of the meal, uh, Jerry provided uh, the dessert, and uh, he dispensed uh, the malted milk balls here uh, very equitably, I thought. However, his aim was sometimes off. Actually, we had uh, very little time on orbit uh, on our timeline, and uh, it turned out that the few moments we did have to relax were uh, very precious. On the fourth flight day, we performed uh, the planned EVA for this mission, which has its principal objective to do flight tests on six different ways of getting around large space structures. We had uh, the idea that this was going to be five and a half years before we did this EVA, not about 12 hours since the last one. Uh, but it made it uh, just as sweet nonetheless. Here we are doing one of those types of translation methods, and that's where when you put your feet in a cart that is able to slide along a rail and propel yourself by hand motion. We were testing whether you needed one or two handrails to do that. It turns out it's uh, very easy to move along. You can give yourself a couple of pulls and go all the way to the end of the bay. Uh, we constructed this rail all the way down towards the flag there at the end of the bay uh, after the ray Observatory was deployed. Uh, the second method that we tested uh, on orbit was a kind of a railroad hand car that you can see uh, in uh, this view. Of course, one thing most people don't realize right off is half the EVA is going to be at night. And uh, visibility was excellent. We had no, no difficulty. And some of these tests, I don't even remember if it was day or night. Uh, that, uh, that worked well, and we also tested a new type of uh, leg restraint device um, that the engineering community here at the Johnson Space Center had developed. The third method was a kind of motor generator set in which the operator hand-cranked a generator, and the electricity thus produced was transmitted to a motor down by the foot restraint. Again, that worked very well. We found some surprises, all of them good. Uh, these work much better in zero-g than they do on the ground, proving again the value of flight test uh, for any of the space station gear. Uh, this, for space station or any large space structure, we learned quite a lot, not only here, but of course in the uh, shuttle heat pipe radiator experiment that Linda just described in the mid-deck. Another method of moving around that we wanted to test was a way of keeping your safety tether along with you and making sure that uh, you didn't have to tether to a point way at the end of the truss on a large space structure. Uh, I'm holding here what we call the tether shuttle, which was uh, the transport mechanism for my safety tether in this test. Uh, we also used it to move around. Here uh, we are ingressing the foot restraint on the uh, remote manipulator arm. Linda had maneuvered it down to where uh, we could put the foot restraint in there and use it as kind of cherry picker. And one of the objectives of the EVA was to find the most efficient ways to use the remote manipulator arm as a work platform uh, in the construction that we'll be doing from the shuttle uh, in the future. It turns out it's an extremely stable platform. Uh, it uh, moves very smoothly. Uh, I keep telling before the flight, I told Linda that was operator technique, and we must have buttered her up good because she did great. It, uh, it was outstanding. It's a great way to move around. It's a great way to do uh, work, and it gives you some spectacular views of the shuttle that I think you'll see in some of the uh, slides. Uh, we also, at the same time that uh, we were doing this, we're testing how much force an astronaut can exert to free a bolt, uh, how much uh, loads he then puts into structure so that sophisticated engineering folks can figure out how strong the structures must be. Here, Jerry and I swapping places on the manipulator foot restraint, uh, which we did uh, near the end of the second EVA. And uh, this activity brought to the close what we called the EVA return to flight. And it, uh, it was the first set of EVAs in five and a half years, but it sure won't be that long again. We're getting ready to do uh, the next EVA mission in April of next year, and after that, HST repair, and then moving on to space station construction. Uh, we were very fortunate during the flight. We had a lot of cloud-free areas that we were interested in observing from space, and we were able to shoot a lot of uh, film and video out the window, as well as a lot of still pictures. 
And this is one of the scenes uh, coming up on the uh, Middle East over the area of Kuwait. And I guess it's, we could very vividly see from the shuttle the unfortunate occurrence of all of the, uh, the oil fi fires down there and the smoke, smoke plumes and just the big smoke clouds uh, that were being formed. There's a pan across Southern California as we, we flew by. Uh, the white you see near the top of the screen is the snow on top of the Sierra Nevadas. I guess they've gotten uh, near uh, 60 to 75 percent of the average snowfall all came late in the spring. The San Joaquin Valley is to the left of the scene as you come down, uh, coming into the center now. The V-shaped valley is the Antelope Valley or the high desert. In the center of that you can uh, see Edwards Air Force Base or at least Rogers Dry Lake Bed. Uh, it was a panoramic view. These uh, next two views are sped up to four times what we actually saw, and you're going to have to stand or lay on your left side to actually see this one correctly. Uh, what you're seeing here is the entire southwest of the United States, all the way from the uh, California, Mexico area, across uh, Arizona and the uh, Grand Canyon area. And in a little while, you'll see a white spot about in the middle of the frame coming into the top of the field of view, and that's White Sands, New Mexico. Absolutely beautiful view of all of southwestern United States. There's a white sands coming into the field of view right now. Uh, second view again sped up at the same rate is as we approach the southwestern coast of uh, South America. Uh, the Andes down there are just absolutely beautiful to look at. Uh, you can see how rapidly the uh, coastal plain of uh, South America rises into the highlands of the Andes. You can see the large uh, salt pans out there as well as uh, all types of indications of volcanic activity in the not too distant past. One of the secondary experiments we, call, we carried was an amateur radio station uh, called Shuttle Amateur Radio Experiment. We used this equipment, which was all put together uh, by amateur radio <coughs> enthusiasts, to contact uh, students across the uh, United States and share our spaceflight experience with them. We also uh, talked to students in Australia and people in uh, uh, South America and Africa. As uh, you can see, we also uh, got some uh, gymnastic exercise. We thought uh, that some of the maneuvers performed on orbit uh, were uh, Skillfully executed, we rated Linda 10.0 for enthusiasm on that last uh, rolling maneuver. And uh, we found that in general, uh, the zero gravity experience was one that we all enjoyed. We uh, adjusted to it very well and uh, had uh, quite a good time. We found that we had uh, skills and abilities that uh, far exceeded those we had on Earth. <laughs> Following uh, the uh, uh, second EVA on flight day five, we uh, began our flight control system checkout. This is when we begin to prepare for return to Earth, and we exercise all the aerodynamic controls that uh, we will need upon re-entry to the atmosphere to begin our transition from spacecraft uh, to uh, aerodynamic vehicle again. We, here you can see the elevons being cycled through their full range of motion. This exercises the hydraulic systems, the actuators, and we perform diagnostic tests on all of the displays and controls that we'll be using in the upcoming uh, re-entry evolution. For re-entry, we get back into the uh, orange launch and entry suits. These suits are, uh, provide us with protection from uh, reduced atmospheric pressure. They provide our communications and uh, thermal protection. And also, uh, something that might not be so apparent is that uh, they provide uh, anti-G protection in the form of a G suit, which is very similar to what uh, is worn on a high-performance fighter. After a week of zero G, a uh, single G, or perhaps one and a half to two, feels like a tremendous load. And so we, uh, here you can see we take on additional fluid. We actually load our bodies with uh, prescription uh, w water and salt uh, indicated or provided by the doctors so that we can begin to recover some of the blood volume, which is uh, normally reduced during uh, orbit. The deorbit burn was uh, done, actually we delayed a day as you all know, so we came in on the seventh day. Deorbit burn was done over Africa uh, nearing sunset and we flipped around and flew the whole entry at night uh, to arrive at a sunrise over California and that's the view out the forward windows. You see the bright flashes on the back of Ken's helmet and as you turn, the, Linda turned the camera and looked out the overhead window back towards the tail. That's actually looking down the wake of the airplane behind as the superheated air is reconverging behind the airplane. <coughs> is uh, quite impressive to say the least. There's the approaching sunrise as we're uh, just coming up on the California coastline. And uh, 
quite a beautiful sight. The entry was uh, perfectly normal. We had several program test inputs, as they were called, which are automatic inputs to the flight control system to perturb the Atlantis, get additional aerodynamic data so we can fly it further forward centers of gravity. Uh, we entered the heading alignment circle and came around to land. Uh, the landing was a low energy landing uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, uh, I got a little bit low energy on the heading alignment circle and was slowly making it up. And as well, we had some rather unusual winds that were of high velocity down to lower altitudes. So that the two of those factors translated into a, a lower energy but safe touchdown. Uh, you see one of the advantages of being able to carry a camcorder on a flight. We've got some footage that we were never able to get before out the windows. And uh, Linda was holding that camcorder tethered and that last scene was looking. And that scene there is looking out uh, one of Ken's middle windows looking forward into the side as well. So you can get a real feel for how it looks out the window. Uh, we pre-flared and lowered the landing gear at, at 300 feet and then came on down and touched down. <clears throat> It was a real nice day at Edwards. The temperature was around, I think, 37 degrees when we landed, and it felt really nice when we got out. We landed on uh, Lake Bed Runway 33, which is one that has not been landed on before by the, by the shuttle. There was a braking test, which we did to apply uh, light braking. This was the first flight of Atlantis with uh, carbon brakes on the wheels as opposed to the beryllium which we'd had before. Uh, they worked fine. There was, there was no uh, adverse effect of those brakes at all. It felt real good. So uh, we rolled to a stop, went through the post-landing switch list to power things down and get the Atlantis ready for a handover to the ground crew uh, and then got out. We did the uh, typical handshake at the bottom of the stairs and then a walk around to look at the Atlantis and uh, at a glance, and also from reports we've heard after the flight, it was in real good shape. It suffered uh, very little damage uh, to the tile, both from the ascent and also uh, from landing on a lake bed. And uh, that ended the STS-37 flight. SRB ignition and roll program to a direction of due east off the pad. The vehicle, its four and a half million pound stack with orbiter tank and SRBs, continued to accelerate upward and uh, going faster and faster through ever uh, uh, decreasing density air, we approached the point of uh, maximum dynamic pressure, about Mach 1, and here you can see uh, shock waves standing off the uh, uh, frustrums of the solid rocket boosters. The uh, first stage continued for approximately two minutes, at which time the solid rocket boosters had expended all their fuel and uh, they were uh, jettisoned into the ocean. Here you see the boosters being separated, and as they continue to burn out, they would uh, parachute back into uh, the Atlantic Ocean for recovery and analysis. Main engine uh, burn continued for a total of eight and a half minutes, at which time we achieved our MECO velocity on target and uh, set ourselves up for our OMS-2 burn and arrival on orbit. One of the most significant events that we perform early uh, after getting into orbit is the opening of the payload bay doors, which you're seeing here. Not only is this significant for us to set up shop and to be able to stay on orbit, but it also provides us with our first uh, very beautiful view of the Gamma Ray Observatory back there in the back end of the bus, and, and that's the prime reason we were there, and we were all ready to go to work. The opening the doors also gives you an opportunity to use those uh, aft windows to take a look at some of the Earth's beautiful views, and this was an early one. On April 5th, uh, we got out of bed about 4.30 in the morning, ate breakfast, checked the weather, got suited up, and uh, jumped in the Astro van to ride to the launch pad. I frankly didn't have a lot of confidence we were going to launch that morning. It was raining at the time, but uh, the weather cleared and off we went. After what was a textbook countdown and a very short hold, the uh, liftoff was, I might say, very entirely nominal and entirely exciting. The uh, <laughs> engines uh, started at T minus six seconds, followed by... Once we came across uh, northeastern Africa. On flight day two, we set up some preparations for deploying the Gamma Ray Observatory. Those were three main types. One was getting uh, the Gamma Ray Observatory all checked out in cooperation with the Payload Operations Control Center and Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt. Uh, the second was to prepare ourselves by pre-breathing pure oxygen so that when Jerry and I went down to 5 PSI in the suits, we wouldn't get the bends. The third was preparing the suits for the EVA and Jerry's starting that.